It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of August 20th, 2004. We're kind of in that uh, pattern where the summer movie season is coming to a close, and that means it's the dumping weeks for uh, the, free, begin, the, le the last couple of weeks of August and the beginning of September before we get to the stuff that the studios are proud of. We've got three movies to look at today, and will one of these movies be a film that they're proud of? Maybe. But it certainly isn't this first one. Uh, this is the uh, prequel to The Exorcist. The Exorcist, The Beginning. On August 20th. Is there someone inside you? Yes. Go back before the story you know. Father Merritt. I know my name. And witness. He will seek to poison your mind. Chapter of Evil. For the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The beginning. Rated R. Starts August 20th. Stellan Skarsgård running nude in the Avengers movie looks more dignified than this film. Think about that for a second. Oh, wait. Uh, the Exorcist, the beginning. You have, uh, like I said, Stellan Skarsgård who plays uh, Father Lancaster Merritt, whose faith has been renounced after his experience in World War II as he works as an archaeologist and discovers dark occurrences while excavating in Kenya. This is a prequel, like I said, to The Exorcist. It's actually the fourth in the series, and the first one produced by, um, a second one produced by Morgan Creek, who did like, Exorcist 3. Uh, but this has an interesting story in the fact that this film was basically retooled from an already finished project. Uh, Paul Schrader's Dominion prequel to The Exorcist, which won't come out until next summer, but um, Morgan Creek basically said that they thought the film would be unsuccessful, so they basically had to rewrite the script and... It was basically made into a, a totally different movie, and um, the end result is this piece of garbage. Uh, Dominion, the prequel to The Exorcist, I will say this, is definitely the better of the two films. But is it a good movie? Mm, not so much. Uh, this one is just a film that I feel like is really trying way too hard to capture the zeitgeist and the spirit of the original Exorcist movies. Even with something like Exorcist 3, which was a nice return to form for the Exorcist series, still I think it's the best Exorcist movie that we've had. It's just a... It's, it's the, nothing compares to the original Exorcist. The original Exorcist is such a classic horror movie with scenes that are just still so intense and terrifying... Even all these years later, 50 plus years later, that movie still works on so many levels. This does not. This is Rennie Harlan who directed this movie. A director who used to be very profi possibly very profitable and very powerful as a director. And then he really kind of sh shit the bed with movies like this. This and then he did The Covenant. He did the, uh, 12 Rounds with John Cena. The Bad Legend of Hercules movie from 2014. And now his most recent film... The Strangers uh, trilogy, because we needed a reboot. Tri we need not only a reboot of The Strangers, but a reboot trilogy of The Strangers. And uh, yeah, like I said, it's pretty much everything that's is everything wrong with this director as a whole. Started off so promisingly with stuff like Cliffhanger, Die Hard 2, The Long Kiss Goodnight, and now it's just becoming this regurgitated garbage. And this is one of the films that really began the inevitable downfall of this director as a whole. And, you know, Stella Skarsgård, of course, has gone on to become a much more be beloved actor, even after a movie like this. But the film is just really lackluster. It doesn't have anything scary in it. It's pretty generic. It's nothing intense or terrifying. It's stuff that we've seen done over and over and over again in these Exorcist movies. And it just... That shit gets old really, really fast. And, um... This is definitely a film that gets really, really old really, really fast, so... So yeah, that is Exorcist the Beginning. Uh, how about we have a movie that I personally kind of enjoy? Uh, we have uh, Dax Shepard, Matthew Lillard, and Seth Green in Without a Paddle. Well, still a for that, Less vomiting. This summer, country up there. Hey, look at this! Seemed like in the 2000s, every bear wanted to fuck Seth Green because uh, he would face a bit. Uh, not even a bear, and animals in general, because in this movie it's a bear, in Old Dogs it was a gorilla that wanted to bang Seth Green. I mean, um, but comparing those, that, that movie, this movie, this one is Citizen King compared to that one, but um, 
Without a paddle, you've got the story of three reunited childhood friends, Seth Green, Matthew Lillard, Doc Shepard, who go on a trip to a, up a remote river in order to search for the lo loot of long-lost airplane hijacker D.B. Cooper. And you also have a cast that includes Ethan Supley, Abraham Ben Ruby, Rachel Blanchard, Christina Moore, Bonnie Somerville, and most notably, Burt Reynolds. And um, it was a hit when it came out, and even though it did get the best reviews overall, I thought it was all right for what it was. It's no, co it's no great comedy like the ones we've already had this year. It's more on the lines of something like an Envy or something like um, what was the other comedy that came out this year that wasn't that great, but I, I did still enjoy it. I can't remember it. I could have sworn I talked about it recently, but this is one of those movies where you need, you kind of have to go into it knowing what you're gonna get. What you think is gonna happen in a film like this is indeed going to happen. But they've got three very good charismatic funny leads with Green, Lillian, and Shepard, and a good supporting cast. I think Burt Reynolds overall really is very funny in the film. Not all the jokes work in general, but the idea of them going out into the middle of the middle of the of the call middle of the uh, the not even the jungles, but in the forest, if you will, and traveling up this river. It does lead to some really good, funny comedy, comedic elements to it. I like the scene with the two hippie chicks. You know, one of them has the, you know, that scene in the trailer where she's talking about, you know, she's she's all natural and got all the hair and all that. That stuff's kind of funny. And like, sometimes the jokes can work. Other times, not so much. It's very fifty-fifty at times. There is a lot of there is some homoeroticism, like like the scene from the trailer where, you know, there's a, there's a, like our only chance is to warm up, and Matthew Lillard's like, um, I for one choose death, and you hear like the, I don't see the song, I don't see nothing wrong with a little bump and grind, and then it's just like just never leaves the cave, like stuff like that gets pretty old pretty fast, and it's just it's not prevalent all the way through the movie, but when it happens, it really just kind of goes like, okay, this is kind of what I've expected the movie to be like, but. It, like I said, it's very rare that that happens. And the movie overall is a very enjoyable film. It's it can be very funny at times. It can be really silly and, and over the top at times. But it knows what it's trying to be. It's not going for anything too grand or spectacular. And like I said, it's not trying to be like some of the great comedies we've had in th this year already. It's not trying to be a frat pack movie where you have stuff. We've had stuff like Anchorman, Starsky and Hutch, um, Dodgeball. Like those are great comedies. Harold and Kumar. Even though it's not a frat pack movie, maybe that's the one I'm thinking. No, that's not the one I'm thinking of. But I'm thinking of one that I can't remember what it was. I think it was already out of theaters at this point. But bottom line here, with or without a paddle, if you go into it knowing exactly what you're going to get into and and just have, go in there and have a good time with it, I think you can have a good time with it. It can be very funny. It can be very silly. It can be over the top, and it works for the most part. If you're looking for something a little bit more than that, then uh, I'd say skip it. But me personally. I really enjoy this movie a lot. I think it is a ton of fun. So, uh, let's go ahead and move on to our last film, and that is Benji Off the Leash. <laughs> Warning, adults have been known to enjoy this movie even more than their kids. This is big. Ted Bear says this is an incredible story. Exciting, heartwarming, and entertaining. Is that a fact? This could be a big deal. Michael Medved says irresistible. Gannett newspapers, hilarious. <laughs> The New York Post raves, if you want to raise humane, ethical kids, take them to see this movie. If you think it could be a star. Looks to me like he already is. Leonard Maltin says, surefire family entertainment. I'm giving this film my hot boat. Benji off the leash, rated PG. Opens Friday. Uh, I call bullshit on that. Adults will like this more than kids. Well, when you have a bunch of quotes from critics who are adults, yeah, what do you think they're gonna, what do you think's gonna happen? But, um... This movie's not made for adults. This is clearly made for kids, and it's another Benji movie. And um, all I can say is I just want Benji to go back to, to tricking wolves off of falling off of cliffs like in Benji the Hunted. Of heart-pounding suspense. Can we please get that Benji back, please? Can we get the ones where uh, Jane Seymour wants to bang up, wants to bang Benji? That is an actual movie that exists back in the day. Oh, Heavenly Dog, and uh, yeah. Chevy Chase turns into Benji, and uh, Jane Seymour apparently wants to fuck the dog, and it's a really bizarre movie, and um, uh, we'll eventually get to that one on time about the movie's flashback when we get to the start of the 80s, but um, this is a much more family-friendly film, Benji Off the Leash, or Benji Returns Racks to Riches, which is not a good sign if you can't figure out the title of the damn movie, but... Um, in the film, three unlikely, unsuspecting souls who come face to face with that moment in their lives when they must straight stand and be counted. Uh, for Sheldon, it's difficult because he doesn't appear to be the brightest guy in the room, although he might be the funniest. For Colby, it might even be more difficult because he's only 14 years old and up against enormous odds. 
What are those enormous odds? Fuck you, we're not going to tell you. Come see it, kids. Uh, for Benji, it's almost impossible because, after all, he's just a dog. Lost and alone with nothing but a belligerent bird and a bungling string mutt to hell. A band of unlikely comrades brought together by the least likely bunch for, uh, for a common, courageous purpose. Things will change, lives will be saved, because Benji is off the leash. God, I wish I could get paid as much money as some of these people that have to put these synopsis together. There really is nothing of value to this movie whatsoever. This is just... It's another Benji movie, and one that could have easily gone straight to DVD. There's no big names in the cast. The director is not a big name anymore. You know, and this was his last film he directed before he passed away, too. So, I mean... Really, there is stuff that you can do with Benji as a whole. I mean, there are things that can be done with this character. Cross him over with Lassie, you know, one of the other great dog characters in film. You know... Do something different. Do something unique with it. Don't do another movie like this where you just you're just making it because Benji is a name, and you'll try to get as many people as you can to go to go see it. It just doesn't work here, and it's just I hate to say it because Benji is not a is not a bad dog character as a whole. It's just like he really is nothing that spectacular when he's in a movie where he's literally got nothing to do. I mean, have him do something special. I mean, make him like Air Bud. I mean, Air Bud at least did something other than just be the cute dog in there. Like, Air Bud plays sports. You know, Lassie saves people. Like, Benji just kicks people, and then he's considered a hero. I mean, like I said, go back to the days when Benji was literally throwing wolves off of a mountain. A heart-pounding suspense. Somebody out there will go take Benji back to his roots, damn it. But, um, but yeah, for what this is... It's a Benji movie. It's nothing spectacular for someone like in my age group, but um, I guess for little, little kids, it's fine, I guess. It's completely harmless, but why don't you show them something better than something that's just harmless? I mean, show them, show them some much better movies than this. I mean, this is just, just a bad film. It's just nothing really that memorable to it whatsoever, and I'm sure there's a future for Benji out there somewhere, but not with movies like this. And so, with that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies, and next week we have more pointless sequels, but before we get to that, we have probably the best overall movie of the week with Hero, but then we go to get stuff like Anaconda's The Hunt for the Blood Orchid, because I know people were demanding an Anaconda sequel seven years after it was released, and I know people were also looking forward to Super Babies, Baby Geniuses 2. I can't even finish that with a straight face. Um... And also, uh, Aaron Eckhart in, Subject Zero, in Suspect Zero. So we got four films to look at next time around. We will delve into those all on the next episode. Uh, but until then, uh, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, uh, please do the place on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And also, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So, excuse me. Uh, so with that said, I am off. I will see you guys next time. And until then, as always, take care.